Good morning, everyone. I think I'm unmuted. Yes? Okay, cool. I hope everyone is hearing me. Uh, we are meeting on Zoom today, guys. Isn't that awesome? Um, for our description this morning, let's take a look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, and we're looking at, at verse 12. This is God speaking to Jeremiah, because Jeremiah had some lot of challenges. And he said in verse 12, the Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am, I am, sorry, watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Jeremiah was, was a prophet of that nation, right? And he had many challenges. Just like Jeremiah, we as Christians, as God's people, will have many challenges. Even an unscheduled Zoom Sunday service. And just like Jeremiah, God will see that his word is still fulfilled to us. So with that, I would like to welcome everyone to the Sunday morning service of the Port of Spain Church of Christ. So let's pray, guys. Father, thank you for the ability to still worship you, God, despite all the challenges, God. You have still moved in a powerful way, God. I pray, God, that we are, um, despite all the challenges, consumed with you, Father. Consumed, Father, with you. Your work today, Father, that we are distracted, that, Father, we praise and glorify you, Father. I pray, God, that this service goes well and that we have our friends, that we have our families, Father. We have other people who are joining us because it's online, Father, like this. I pray, God, that that, um, that you, God, will fill us with your spirit and uh, enable us to uh, to see the week ahead with you, Father. We knew that we just need it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I also want the money. Now let's. Oh, 
man's land. I'm on my way.
will glorify the King of kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I am. And Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of above the universe, all praise to Him we give. Sing hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great Sing hallelujah. And hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I For our offering this morning, we'll take a look at a fam uh, familiar scripture that we know in Matthew chapter 22, and we're reading from verse 36, um, the greatest command. Um, teacher, um, one of the Pharisees asked, which is the greatest command in the law? Jesus replied, love your law with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hung on these two commandments. God is all about people. If we were uh, to, um, if we were to, if we were to, with God, sorry, yes, God, if we were to love God with all our hearts, sorry, and all our soul and all our minds, and love people with the same depth and intensity, can you imagine the harvest? The amount of people love will be given to. In turn, they will reciprocate and also give. It will be infectious. It will make Acts 2.42 look like a walk in the park. Like when um, the building of the sanctuary when Moses begged the people to stop giving in Exodus 36, 6. Can you stop for a minute and think about what that would look like? God's spirit will be on overdrive. Think about it. I have no doubt, and I believe that God did this before. And he can use us to do this. If every one of us just give our all. So guys, we may not have the opportunity to give right now. And those who can give online, please do. Right? And those um, next Sunday, you know, bring whatever it is and give it to God. Let's turn this world upside down for God. Let's go before God in prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. I pray that our giving amongst the loving people intensely and deeply so that there'll be no needy persons among us, as you said in Acts. It has happened before, God. This can happen again. That people will, be, will have no needs physically, or spiritually, Father, everything will be will be totally filled, Father. 
I pray, God, that we can capture your vision for this in our lives, Father. That as a community, we can move as one, as your son prayed for that to happen, Father. It will be a glorious day, Father, when we all move as one community, Father. Nothing will be impossible. The church will be so vibrant and grow and people's lives be affected. Even our country will be affected, God. There's so many things that are that um that are happening around us, Father. Our people are in so much pain. I pray, God, that we rise up to the occasion, Father, that we stand in the gap, Father, and we, we can be all that we can be, Father, for you and for others. Let's love people deeply. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Oh, sorry. Um, we turn over to Michael, who will um, lead us in today's message. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Pray that um, my audio is fine, video is fine, that you all can hear me. Um, it's good to be on Zoom. <laughs> uh, this kind of feels like 2020 again, you know, back on Zoom for sermons. You know, I was just confessing to the, the team, the tech team prior to that, um, you know, I, I was one of those who was turning up and, and I, at, at some point, <laughs> you know, if I'm watching on my bed, you know, um, it may have caused me to um, fall deep into prayer for a brief time. Um, so I'm just reminiscing about those times and what it was like when the world literally turned upside down um, due to the pandemic. And I just think about all that we overcame in that time period, um, you know. Um, it, it could have been very easy for us to just stop meeting. You know what I mean? And I just think, wow, we 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 overcame COVID-19. You know, we're all here, alive and well. And not only that, you know, we're here as a body, as a church. We were able to utilize the technology and we just had to pivot. You know, we, we, there's, we couldn't meet, right? We couldn't meet as a congregation and we moved on to, to, to Zoom. And um, we continue to meet as as God calls us to, and um, so this is no this is nothing strange for us this morning, all right. Um, and um, you know I'm just excited that we're all here and we're all here to hear God's word and to to really dive deep into what He has for us to, for us to hear this morning. And so um, we're kind of just picking back up where uh, Nino would have started in the book of. Uh, of First Corinthians, and personally, it's a it's a favorite book of mine because it's essentially a rebuke that was written by Paul, who was an appointed apostle by Christ Himself to the church, um, to which we you know we get to learn from, right? The fact was that the Corinthian church was going through a very messy period, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I read Corinthians and I look at, at what Paul was sharing. And, and to me, I'm like, wow, it, it, this, gives, this gives us hope. Because, you know, when we as a church, as a body, start seeing signs of, of similar issues being uprooted, you know, we have God's word to guide us. And we don't have to, we don't have to wait for a letter from anyone, right? We don't have to wait for Paul's rebuke. We have the word of God, which is going to guide us. And so... um. At this time, I encourage you to pray with me as we dive a bit deeper into chapter one of 1 Corinthians. Uh, Heavenly Father God, um, what a privilege it is to be able to meet uh, despite uh, not having the use of Cipriani in the building this morning. Um, Father, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking us through that challenging time in COVID-19 and bringing us to a point where, you know, um, we, we are able to pivot, we're able to make changes so that we can meet together with one another uh, and, and to, 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 to still fellowship. Father, I pray that you remove me this morning. Pray that you allow us to um, put our worries aside at this point in time uh, to, to, to really give our hearts to what you have for us to hear. Uh, may you speak, may your spirit flow through me, Father, and uh, whatever you have in store for us to learn today, um, that we would commit it to our heart. Open wide our hearts and minds at this time. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. So, uh, 
I like Nino would have started two weeks ago um, in First Corinthians. We, you know, we're reading through uh, chapter one, and um, you know, like I said, the, this letter or this epistle was uh, written by Paul to the church in Corinth, and you know, the church in Corinth it was a very prominent church in ancient Greece, um, both economically and culturally. Um, just based on its location, it was on a thin strip of land on an isthmus connecting two uh, peninsulas. And um, it was known for trade and commerce. And um, because of its location, it also meant that it was, it was kind of like Trinidad, where it's like a, a melting pot of cultures, right? But also languages and, and religion. And so it was a well-known city in Greece at that time. Um, I, I, and and they, even so, you know, given the current times, you know, where we had Olympics, Corinth had the Isthmian Ismi, Ismi, Games, which were like, which was second only to the Olympics. And so these games, you know, just like the Olympics, they had athletic competitions, they had musical arts and, and artistic contexts. And you know, just like the Olympics today, the winnings of these games, you know, they brought great fame and, and, and social status. And, you know, if you think about the Olympics today, we have persons or athletes who compete and when they win, you know, they either get sponsorship, they get fame, they get the, the wealth and stuff that comes with it, you know? Um, and, and so that was just, that was just what it was at that, at that particular point in time. And so it was no surprise that for Paul to, 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 to go preach the word in Corinth, that they would be influenced by the world around them, right? By the Corinthian society around them. And so they were not immune to having division, right? When, when we... What what happens when we elevate someone by society and when we and we praise them on this pedestal? Typically, what happens is division, right? There's a a, a differentiation from oh, this person is that status and that person is this status. And so, if that's the nature of human beings, then Christians are not going to be immune to that. And so, in a community where fame and social status were highly valued, this was the expectation that it would eventually, at some point, seep into the church. And so Paul had to address these divisions directly in 1 Corinthians. And, you know, just the city's culture of competition and individualism, it had led to factions within the church. And so believers started aligning themselves with different leaders, whether it was Paul or Apollos or, or Cephas. And this was just a symptom of what, of the broader societal values. And so what happened was Paul decided, you know what, I'm going to start a church in Corinth. And he stays with them for just about 18 months, a year and some. And once he's planted the church and he realized, okay, you know, I'm ready to move on to the next church so I can go spread the, the gospel. He, he gets word of the quarrels and the division in the church. And so he, he writes this epistle. And so we pick up in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians. Let me share my screen here. All right. All right, so, to, so today we're going to look at the appeal of unity. In 1 Corinthians 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. You know, Paul. Like I said, when he planted this church, he stayed in Corinth for about 18 months. And so he must have formed strong bonds and connections with them. So, so hearing this, you could tell that he was concerned about the health of the church. You know, having planted churches throughout 
um, the Middle East, he would have known what division could lead to, what could division could mean to for churches. You know, division is one of the single biggest killers of the church today. You know, it's, it's Satan's tool to break up the meeting of God's holy people. And, you know, we're reminded that we are God's holy people. I mean, Paul, prior, when, you know, would have uh, preached, he reminded us that we are sanctified through Jesus Christ. But the one killer that Satan can count on for churches is division. And so a church that is disunited is a dying church. And then the question comes, so why is, why, why is there division? Why are there quarrels in church? Well, I think James put it very simply. If we look at James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You see, the thing is, brothers and sisters, I have desires and you have desires. And we are all at war fighting with our desires to please the flesh and to build. And, and so we, we, we build these egos. You know, I must get what I want. You know, I live in for me. I live to please me. You know, you see, to like some extent, I, worship, I must worship in the way that I want to worship. You know, my convictions, my convictions are strong. My convictions are stronger than others. You know, this is what happens in the church. And when we, when, we, when we let our egos take over, that causes fights and quarrels. You know, I, I, can't, I, can't, I, I don't know anyone who has been in the church for more than five years and hasn't had some sort of strife with another brother or sister. And if you have, then amen, praise God. But is this natural that this would happen because our human nature builds these desires and so the flesh takes control at times? You know, I, I think about, you know, you know, just the, just the, the different things that happen in church. And um, I kid you not, last year, um, I, I, when I was working as an as a intern, um, there was a leaders meeting that we hosted here in Trinidad at the Marriott Hotel. And uh, the leaders from the different islands were staying at the hotel and they met and um, they had opportunities for the leaders to share what was going on in their churches and the good things and, and the things they needed help with in, in, in their leadership. And there was this brother in the group that I was in who spoke about uh, uh, having to... To, to, to navigate a situation between these two brothers who were serving as ushers in the church. And <laughs> what was happening with the ushers is that they were, they were having some major struggles with determining how the setup of church should be, whether the chair should be down the middle or to the side and leaving a space for the middle for people to pass. That was the, that was the major uh, a, a cause of quarrel and strife for the church or, or for these two brothers. And so they brought it to this leader and they told him, hey, look what's going on. This brother, like, I put the chairs down and he, 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 he tell people to come and move it and, and make a, a path down the middle. And he, he, he changed up the whole thing. And so this went on for weeks. These brothers were fighting about these chairs. And so this leader was, was, worrying, was wondering, what can he do to help these brothers? And I mean, you could probably laugh about it, and it seems trivial, but this was something that was causing quarrels, right? Their desire was to have the chairs set up in a way that they thought best. I mean, leave it to Christians to turn something that is meant to be positive, right, <laughs> into something negative. And so... What I'm saying is that these desires, if left unchecked, can lead to quarrels among brothers and sisters. You know, if I were to ask you, if, I, if you were to guess, what is a major thing that Christians engage in that lead to divisions? I wonder what you would say. What is, what is some of the major things that lead to division? The first thing that comes to mind, mind is gossip. 
yeah gossip you know gossip stems from the desire to to, to to know something or to know something about someone that others don't know about and so what, what do we get from that we, we we feel important right we feel important when we when i i know something that you don't know about it empowers us for some reason but one thing about gossip is that it says a lot about the person and it reveals what is happening internally. You know, gossip leads to uh, a church that promotes uh, members to be private about their lives, right? If, I, if, I, if I'm a, um, only thinking that about, you know, if I share and I'm vulnerable with someone that this is going to reach so-and-so out there, then I'm, I'm, I'm more inclined to be more private about my sin. And so essentially gossip leads to a lack of trust and causes divisions among us. And so we need to rebuke gossip in our churches. You know, if you, if you have information about something or, or someone, then go talk to that someone, right? Go, go talk to that person directly about it. And so we need to hold each other accountable. If, if a brother or sister comes to you and says, hey, bro, you, you, heard, about, you heard about this thing? Or, or if they're bringing something delicate to you, like, hey, you know, I have to share something with you. Perhaps it might be good for us to ask the question, is it about something or is it about someone? And if it's about someone, you say, hey, bro, nah, I, I, don't, I don't need to know, you know. You know, you could go and go talk to the person first. You know, we need to be mindful of gossip. And so, that wasn't necessarily the case for, for the church in Corinth. What they were struggling with was uh, sort of like, um, it was essentially spiritual leadership and elitism, right? Spiritual elitist, uh, elitism. And, you know, in, 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 verse, in, verse one, in verse 10, sorry, he says, I appeal to you. Paul is appealing to the church here. And by using the word appeal, the translated word is a parakalo, meaning to, to, to call near, to invite, to exhort, to encourage, to, to pull aside, right? It's derived from the preposition para, which means beside, and the verb kaleo, which means to call. So it's essentially you're, you're, as he was calling the church to decide to, 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 to speak to them. He says, I appeal to you. And you can kind of get the heart of, where, of what Paul was trying to, to bring up here, right? He had, he had concern, right? He was earnest in getting their attention about this matter. And so he says, you know, even prior in, in verse one, he, you know, he's, or, or verse four, sorry, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. And so he has this concern for them and he sees this division, not just as a doctrinal issue, but as a threat to the, to the fabric of their communal life in Christ. And so he's pleading with them here to have unity with one another, just as a, as a big brother might be to his siblings if they were quarreling you know, and he takes it upon himself here to rebuke them gently and remind them to what they were called. You see, what they may have missed is, is like, the, the beautiful thing about the church is that we are set apart, right? We're people of all races, of all ethnicities, of, 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 of different levels of status and wealth. And so it's just a mixing pot where people can feel comfortable coming. You know, back in those times, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of women were, were in the church, so much so that it started to supersede the men. Because women, it was, it was uncommon for women to, to, to be in big gatherings like this where there were lots of men, especially in, for any spiritual uh, sort of, of, of worship, right? So there was a ton of women flocking to Christianity because they were not objectified and there was no societal pressures upon them. And so that was the beauty of the church. That's the beauty of the church now. You know, we are rich 
in, in, in a diversity of people in Trinidad, but, but also in our church, you know, where people have different talents who bring different values to the church. And so if we allow division, then there can be no perfect unity that Paul is talking about here. You know, in Psalm 133, in verse 1, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. You know, this is God's vision for the church. That we live together in unity. It says he blesses that. You know, the, the alternative is, is, is just not attractive. I don't know, if, if, have you ever seen siblings fighting in public? You ever, see, you ever see what that looks like? It's worse, actually, if they're adults, right? If you see siblings, adult siblings fighting in public, it doesn't look right. You know, you almost kind of feel embarrassed for them sometimes, right? It's like, oh my goodness, look at them. Oh boy. You know, I, I, could, I could imagine the, the other Gentiles that were amongst them or, or the other unbelieving Jews who were looking at the church and being like, is, is, whew, is this the church, boy? You know, definitely don't want no part of that. And so the question, therefore, is how do we, as a body, how do we attain perfect unity that Paul is talking about here? Right? Does that mean that we sacrifice our doctor doctrinal integrity for the sake of unity? Just so we can please others? Absolutely not. But here's what I think we should do according to the scripture. One is I think we preserve the unity by humbling ourselves for the sake of unity. Right? And so we align ourselves with one mind, one judgment, and one conviction. You know, that, that's, if we look back here, that's what, that's, what, uh, that's what Paul says here. That's what he says here. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. In other versions, it says, in judgment, in opinions, and conviction. We have to be one in mind and thought. What I, the way I think is the way that you must think when it comes to doctrinal issues or, or, or just our doctrine in general. We must be united in that way. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that agreeing is, is that um, we all have to think or have the same perspective on things right? If anything, having different perspectives, it actually adds to the church, right? You know, you know the, the, the way that I might preach will be very different from anyone else. And, and what, what I share is going to stem from my own experiences, my own style, my own uh, an, a narrative, or, or, or not my narrative, but my own way of thinking and according to the scriptures. And so it will be for any other preacher, right? Any other preacher. But guess what? My core beliefs, my convictions, my opinions, it says that must be in agreement with each and every one of you, all the members of God's church. And so the way I think is the way that you must think. And, the way that, and what you say must align with what I say, especially when it comes to, to doctrine. But, I, but, you know, in thinking about it, I, I was thinking, hmm, is it just doctrine that we have to agree in? Right? Is it just, is it just doctrine? You know, I was just thinking, I was like, hmm, I, I wonder if there are other things that we should agree in as well. Maybe, whether it's a sports day, a potluck, should we have it on a Saturday? Should we have it on a Sunday? You know, things like that come up. Should we have three songs at the, at the, at the top of the service? Or maybe it should be five songs at the top of the service. Maybe it should be chairs down the middle, or it should be chairs on the side. 
you know, we need to be in agreement in, in, the, in the trivial things as well too. Because if we don't, that can also lead to division. And so we have to humble ourselves to agree, right? We may have different opinions, but if we, if we, if we truly want to be perfectly united and we have to humble ourselves so that we can agree, right? I, I think you're familiar with the saying, disagree, I, 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 I agree to disagree. I think for the church, we have to uh, uh, humble ourselves to agree because the goal at the end of the day is to glorify God. And that is what we are agreeing on. You know, um, in just thinking about this, and this, this might uh, ruffle a couple of feathers here, but um, I think we need to have the hard discussions. I think we need to have the hard discussions in order to achieve perfect unity. Should women hold roles in leadership? What does that look like? Can a woman lead worship? Can a woman share scripture or do the announcements or maybe even pray before the church? What is the doctrine? What is the, uh, 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 what is the united doctrine that we have on this? It, it's, it almost seems that though, um, uh, we, 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 that difference of opinion, where so in, in trying to appeal to someone's uh, a way of thinking that we don't have a, a, a way of thinking together on this issue, that it has to be, you know, done separately and privately. And I'm like, hey, you know, I just think we need to have open discussions about this. You know, we need to learn from each other. We need to, we need to study the Bible together. That's what the church is all about. And at the end of the day, we must be unified in the gospel. We must agree in particular that Jesus is Lord and that there is no other way to the Father except through him. Amen? This is how we attain perfect unity in Christ. You know, Philippians 2. Philippians 2. Verse 1 says, Therefore, if any of you, if, sorry, sorry, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. That's what the scripture says. We have to be of one spirit and one mind. You know, I think uh, another way in which we can cause division in church is prejudice. You know, when we, when we, when we associate ourselves with like-minded persons and become exclusive, you know, we dissociate ourselves from others in the fellowship. And that also brings about division. And that was what, what was happening in the church. You know, in verse 11, Paul goes on to say, My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. You see, the disciples in Corinth were dealing with a major issue of spiritual leadership elitism. And so they were literally divided in, in, in who they, they were deciding to follow. Some were saying Paul, some were saying Cephas, which, and, and Cephas, that's, that's also, uh, that's Peter, right? And some were saying Apollos. And the thing is, there were some who were saying, well, I follow Christ. And if you think about it, they, they, it's almost like they were just being smart Alex, right? Well, I, well, well I'm more spiritual. I don't, I don't follow them. I, I follow Christ. You know, because maybe because it sounds nice and spiritual. But they too were also dissociating themselves and not promoting unity. And so Christ specifically appointed the apostles, of which Paul was called, such that they would lead the church of that time. And so they were meant to be followed in leadership, right? The, these, the, the, and if you think about it, these guys were... They were, the, they were the rock stars of their time, 
right? You know, Paul started the church. So perhaps some of them felt really strongly about following him. It's like, well, Paul, Paul, Paul started the church. He found he was the founder. So, so of course we follow, must follow Paul. Um, according to Luke, you know, he, it says that he, that Apollos was someone who was a uh, uh, very verse in speaking, right? He, he was a, a verse speaker. And so maybe some were saying, well, yeah, boy, that, that guy, Apollos, he, he know how to handle words, boy. He's very eloquent. He's high, he's highly educated. And yeah, he knows how to preach. I, I, I going to listen to Apollos. Right. And some were probably saying, well, Peter, well, Peter, he actually walked with Christ. You know, he, he was there with him. He, he was there with him through, through, through um, the crucifixion. Uh, or, 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 and just appear to him uh, uh, and re- after he was resurrected. And so I follow, I follow, um, I follow Peter. He's, he's the real guy to follow. But the thing is, if you think, do you think that this was the plan that Jesus had was to appoint these men so that the disciples would have a pick of who to follow? No, of course not. That was not his plan. This came because of the, 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 the favoritism, the, the, the prejudice, and the bias of the people in Corinth. And the thing is, this could be present in our church today, right? You know, we have branches of denominations of Christianity now with different leaders in the faith. And um, now it's almost like you have a pick of, of which church is the right church for me, right? Which one aligns with me? And maybe even a little deeper, more than just the church, is which preacher I like the most, right? Now people are following, are going to different churches because of the person that is preaching. And so now the, the preacher dictates the church that you follow. That was, not, that was not Jesus' plan. You know, we see it all the time, church hopping. You know, and if, if the preacher lead is preaching something that is not in alignment with my own personal convictions or my own personal beliefs, well, then I ain't following that church. But isn't it that the word should shine through? Isn't it that, you, you know, you want to follow a church where the word is what is, 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 is uh, aligning all the disciples and all the people? And, you know, I, I think about it for myself, you know, sometimes... You know, I will admit that I have some unconscious bias when I when I hear or or, or, or see who is going up to, to preach. You know, I could I could sometimes put certain people on a certain pedestal, whether it's because I like their style or um or their personality or or maybe even their delivery. I, I, and maybe I don't know. Some of us do we tune out when certain people come up to, to preach the word of God. My thing is, nothing is wrong with having a preacher whose style resonates with you. That's fine. That's, that's just what it is, right? There's some people who would be able to speak to you a little bit more just because of their own experiences as well. But that is no reason to take spiritual pride in. Like, that's not the reason why you're like, yeah, I'm going to listen to this guy because he, he, he really preaches the word, right? Look what it says in verse 13. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. You know, I, I, love, I love Paul's approach on this, right? He's like, are we literally dividing Christ here? Based on who, who to follow? And the thing is, the division here, um, when the word division is used here and, and or divided, um, it, it's more like in a it's a, like a, in a literal sense, right? When you divide something up, right, you're breaking it up into into pieces to be shared out. And so it was like the disciples were literally sharing pieces of Jesus, right? And so they were dividing Jesus up amongst each other based on who they were following in leadership. And the thing is. Paul here, he takes, he takes no credit. Though he built the church, you know, and he could have easily said, well, 
Yeah, you should. Apollos, you need to follow me. I built this church. You know, that's, that could have been the mindset he could have had. But he said, no, I, Paul, Paul didn't die for you, your sins, you know. I wasn't crucified for your forgiveness. Michael wasn't crucified for your forgiveness. Was it in Paul's name, you know, when you came out of the waters, when you were asked that question? You know, we, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. I mean, again, this is just another example of Christians taking something that is a good thing and turning it negative, right? They were fighting over who was baptized by who, right? They were literally quarreling over who they were baptized by. It's like, who, who were you baptized by? Apollos? Ooh, yeah, yeah. I was baptized by Paul, you know, in the Jordan River on a Sunday. <laughs> On, this, on the same day that Jesus was crucified, that's when I was baptized. I, I'm sure, I'm, you know, I'm sure your baptism was okay as well too, you know? And so we elevate ourselves even in the smallest things. But I love what Paul went on to say. In verse 14, he says, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized in the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. You know, Paul is like, I don't want no part of this quarrel. And he points them back to who? He points them to Jesus. He's like, I am glad that I didn't baptize any or many of you, so that you could say that, yeah, yeah, Paul baptized me. He says, the only people I can remember is Crispus and Gaius. Oh, and, and, I, and I think I remember I baptized some people in, in the household of Stephanas. But honestly, I really don't remember anyone else. And the fact is, it doesn't matter who you were baptized by. It doesn't matter. And so Paul is taking no credit for the people that he baptized. And the thing is, sometimes we could do that, right? But we think, well, boy, how many people, um, how many people Ma Michael baptized for? Ooh, how long have you been a Christian for? Hmm. I'm not sure I should be listening to Michael, you know. I, I baptized, I baptized 30 people in the past three months, you know? And we puff up ourselves, and I'm so great, and I'm so awesome. And conversely, you know, I, I thought about it, and I was like, Sometimes we bring ourselves down internally because like, whoa, boy, I, I only, I've been a Christian for, for 15 years and I only baptized three people. And so we diminish ourselves because of the, 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 the status, right? And that's what, we, that's what we bring into the church, right? We bring in this, 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 uh, this worldly view of achievement and, 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 uh, and things that boost us up. You see, Paul understood as a preacher appointed, as an apostle, that it was not about him. It was not about him. You know, I, 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 love, I love how Paul decides to, to go about the latter part of this passage, he says, for Christ did not send me to baptize. Christ did not send me to baptize. What he sent me for was to preach the gospel. Our sole purpose as Christians is to follow Christ and to preach the gospel. That is it. It doesn't matter where, but it does matter how. Not necessarily delivery, because you don't need to be an Apollos to preach the word. You don't need to have two bachelors and a master's or to be a disciple for five plus years 
young Christians. You don't need to be baptized for a long period or, or be a Christian for a long period of time. Just by virtue of you following Christ and his word, you are more than equipped to share the gospel. And the way you do it is that you just point people to Christ and not to yourself. That's it. You point people to Christ. He says, I came to preach. I came to, I came not to, not to, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. You know, to, to point to ourselves is to diminish the power of the gospel and the cross in someone's life. And to be honest, we can't necessarily diminish the power of the cross. But the second we try to draw attention to our communication skills or our knowledge and my and, and, and my power and that, that is when we diminish the effectiveness in delivering God's word, in delivering the gospel. So we don't, we don't necessarily diminish the actual power because someone could go ahead and they can read the word of God and they can, they can come to Christ themselves, right? But if we are going out sharing the word, sharing the gospel, and we are appointing uh, to things other than Christ, then we are diminishing our effectiveness in delivering the gospel. And so we have to be mindful of that. You know, Christ died so that we may be unified in him. That's why he died, for the sake of unity. And so we can't allow the world to influence us so that division comes among the church. And so I ask you the question, what kind of church member are you? What kind of church member are you? Are you the one that is simply criticizing? Are you the one that are like, nah, man, we, we need to do things this way. This is the right way to do it. You know, why, why, are, they, why are they doing it that way? That don't make, that don't make sense. I'm, or you, maybe you show up, I'm here to be served. Or, or, or maybe, you're, you know, we looking at other people and, hmm, you hear what so-and-so did? You know, what kind of church member are you? Or are you the church member who is humbled, who leaves their ego at the door? They're showing up to serve others. They're offering themselves as vessels to spread the gospel and the great news of Jesus. They're excited about giving God the honor, God the glory. Which, which church member are you this morning? You know, Paul consistently pointed to Christ. Every letter, he made sure to point people to Christ, to Jesus and the cross, and reminded him of his sacrifice. You know, he says, was I crucified for you? <laughs> were you crucified? What, 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 were you baptized in, in, in Paul's name? Absolutely not. We are unified by the cross through Jesus. And we are to be reminded of this. Amen? Amen. And so we too today, we take the communion in remembrance of our Lord. We take the communion to be reminded of his sacrifice. And we take it in a community together so that we have this collective uh, 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 thing, this one thought, this spirit that bounds us together, that connects us. And so we do that in remembrance of Christ this morning. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father God, uh, we are just so grateful for your son, and his sacrifice. Uh, Father, we pray that you remove us, 
that you remove us in all aspects, God, where there may be pride, where there may be uh, anything that would cause division among us, the gossip, the criticism of one another, um, the desire to have our own way. I pray, God, that we would lean into uh, your spirit that humbles us. And Father, in all circumstances, that we would give you the glory and all the honor. Father, um, we stand here blameless before you because Christ decided that he would take it upon himself to, 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 to be crucified, to go through pain and suffering so that we too may be able to appear before you in heaven without blemish. And so, Father, I pray that uh, we continue to allow our hearts to be molded. I pray that your word touches our hearts this morning. I pray, Father, that we would strive as a church, as a body, towards unity. I pray that we would strive to, to love one another, that we would uh, spread the gospel, sharing the, the beauty of what it is to be a part of the church, of the Port of Spain Church of Christ. Father, we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.